Okay, so hi everybody again. Uh, I already introduced myself on last Tuesday, and today I'm going to talk to you about QOM. So let's start from the title of my presentation. The first word is QOM. That's easy. The second is exegesis, which means critical explanation or interpretation of a text, usually but not necessarily of a religious kind. In this case, it's obviously code. The other word is apocalypse. Now, how many of you think of zombies when you have <laughs> apocalypse? <laughs> okay, so I guess all the others think of doomsday or something like that. Actually, what uh, I meant when choosing the title of the talk is the original meaning of the words. It comes from two Greek words. One means out of, and one of me. One, the other means hide, hiding, whatever. So basically, apocalypse means uncovering disclosure of what's hidden, which has something to do with doomsday and absolutely nothing to do with zombies. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the um, uh, the outline of the talk is what is QM, how do you use it, and uh, how it could be improved and why it is like that, basically. So, QM was introduced so for this purpose. All device creation, device configuration, and backend creation, backend configuration, should be done through a single interface rigor with rigorous support for introspection of runtime objects and type capabilities. In short, magic. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, can go wrong if you don't get it exactly right. So one would wonder if it worked or it went like this. And I guess you could take a poll uh, among QM developers, but I'm not sure that it would really have good results. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see actually how QM was used. Uh, we have a couple of backends implemented using QM. A random number generator and the memory hot plug backend. Uh, console information is exposed uh, using backend, using QM. There was a talk on Tuesday, I think, by Gerd about uh, the graphics subsystems. Devices were the first uh, thing to use QM. It was converted from the older QDev system. And the nice thing that is pretty recent is that uh, device interrupts and device memory regions now are also QM. And last but not least, uh, the machine options uh, and the machine object are also set as properties of a QM uh, object. So among all the nice things in, in that uh, idea of QM, we did achieve uh, uh, usage of QM for new backends, not for the old ones, but at least for the new ones. Transitions are always a, a problem. Unfortunately, anything that's related to introspection hasn't quite materialized. And there was also an intended interface mostly unused. We have a couple of cases where you can uh, program objects uh, or retrieve information using QM, get property, and set property, but there are very few. At least we had two unexpected benefits from QM. A clear model of object lifetime, uh, which helps a lot when dealing with uh, multi-threading. And also, we were able to come up with an interface to create uh, objects that is much better than anything we had before, like device head, uh, network head. Of course, we only use it for those couple of backends and for IO threads, but it's still better than nothing. So what happened? Certainly. QOM had a pretty sound design. It integrates well with the rest of QM, as we'll see, and it has no problems that no problem that cannot be fixed. Unfortunately, it, at the time it was introduced, there wasn't really a, a um, good uh, reason to embrace QOM. Uh, adding new backends happens rarely. We have like two or three now, three if you can't count the IO thread. And there was already at least decent uh, introspection uh, of QMO data structures 
through QDEV, so minus device, and also through VM state for runtime state of device. The real problem was that there was no um, plan for transition, uh, no, no plan for actually delivering uh, all that uh, QM promise, and uh, the multi-threading work was very much in its infancy, and uh, a lot of things took time just because nobody did them. So, for the rest of this talk, I will look at what went wrong and uh, what went well unexpectedly, and uh, let's see what happened and why QRM delivered something else than what it was supposed to deliver. So this is the first part I will work on, work out how QRM properties work and why introspection is not there yet. So uh, in practice, QRM provides these five things. Uh, class inheritance uh, with objects that are polymorphic and uh, also po polymorphic properties within objects. I will come back to the fact that class uh, inheritance exists for um, methods and like the, the implementation, but the external interface with properties is actually instance based, so like more akin to prop prototypes as you find in JavaScript or similar languages. Uh, also, an important point part of uh, QM is the composition tree that will be the topic of the second or third at this time part of the talk. And uh, also, QM provides a very useful generalized uh, factor interface. Everything is based on properties as far as the external interface goes. Properties are the external interfaces of an object, and they can be used uh, uh, to teach an object how it will behave, like before the object is started or activated, you set these properties. You can also have properties for inspections that, that are read after the object is started. There are some very rare cases, actually one got committed today, where you have properties that are written at any point uh, of the lifetime of an object by the management interface. So something that is written from the outside while the VM runs. In fact, there are even very few examples of inspection properties. Almost all usage of properties is really limited to uh, teaching an object what to do. So how big a memory will be, what will be the file to read the random numbers from, and so on. There are some similarities between QM properties and CCFS files, except that you cannot read arbitrarily, arbitrary bytes like you would do with cat or DD on CCFS. Instead, we are based on QAPI types, QAPI structs. So, QAPI is a framework to move QEMU to the next level of feature, function, and robustness. This is another citation from our beloved former maintainer. Is he around? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, wh what it means in practice is uh, actually something uh, not hard to explain, but really effective. QAPI decomposes serialization of uh, a C struct or a C type into two steps. Marshalling, which as you probably know means take something that is complicated, a composite type and decomposing it into primi primitive types with some structure around them. And then transport, which means going from the primitive types to the representations and back. Marshalling is very nicely done by automatically generated code. Uh, we have transport instead that is done by hand uh, using visitors, uh, the, and we have various kinds of visitors, QObject, uh, QMOps, uh, string visitor, many things that you can transport QAPI types on. And uh, there are input and output visitors for the two directions, primitive type to representation or vice versa. Now actually, since this is a fairly simple and effective design, it works. Uh, the data types that QAPI uses and thus QRM also reuses are scalars, uh, integers, strings, booleans, no null values, only well-defined uh, values. Instead of null, we have optional fields that basically has the same functionality but is easier for backwards compatibility. Uh, now JSON arrays are uh, 
non-homogeneous because uh, JSON is totally um, dynamic type. JavaScript is totally dynamic type. But in QAPI, we actually restrict to homogeneous array, arrays that we, have, we call something list, like, I don't know, a block device list or something like that. Uh, enumerations are interesting because, for example, they are uh, usually treated as strings from the user point of view. Uh, like when you do minus device or when uh, or device said, but on the C side uh, they are represented as enums, uh, so as small integers, and of course this is the most effective way to deal with them, both on the JSON side and on the C side. On top of these, of course, you have records, possibly nested and possibly discriminated. Again, they are serialized as JSON dictionaries, but there's no anarchy as you find in JSON. It's actually strongly typed. And if you pass extra fields uh, or something that QMU doesn't like, it will throw an error at you. So QMU property types can be split in two parts, non-objects and objects. And non-objects are just QAPI types, while objects are of two kinds, the children and the links. The children are uh, interesting because there can be only one path, or, and actually exactly one path, that goes from the root of the QM composition tree uh, to down to an object following children properties. So you can, let's say you have a, a device, you will follow machine, then you will follow peripherals, and then you f will follow, I don't know, uh, HD for hard disk drive. And because the name of the properties was machine, peripheral, and HD, the canonical path of the object would be slash machine, slash peripheral, slash HD. If you want any alternative paths, you can add li link properties. And also an interesting feature that was added recently is uh, aliases, and these usually have the same type as the target, except that children become links because otherwise you would have a mess of multiple uh, canonical paths, which are not that canonical anymore. Mm. Under the hood, uh, all properties are access to QAPI visitors. It's actually QAPI uh, uh, visitors are, is actually a fairly central concept in uh, in QM. Again. Uh, CCFS abstracts everything around files. We use visitors because that's our uh, API for communication and, uh, and transporting values in and out of QM. Uh, you don't have to write visitors all the time, of course. There are wrappers for strings, bools, and some other stuff. Just like, again, Linux has wrappers around files. So you still have some boilerplates, but some boilerplate code, but it's not too bad in the end. Uh, this is how you use visitors. Uh, a Q object visitor will parse everything that is in the arguments di dictionary, and uh, it will parse an ID, it will parse a type, and then it will recurs to the properties, and everything that, uh, every field that is in the properties will actually bypass the visitor because it's dynamically typed in this case, and will be sent, uh, uh, so this is not pure Q QAPI, but actually what is within the props um, dictionary will have another visitor created on it, and that visitor will be used to set, in this case, the file name, or there could be more properties, all using the same visitor. Uh, Q QMU opt is used for the command line and for the so-called human interaction monitor. Uh, you can see that the commands are really the same, and there's a lot of similarity between, uh, of course, the Q object one and the QMU opt uh, commands. The difference is that uh, QMU opt is not type safe. You could write like file name equals 12, and of course it will be interpreted as a file named one two. If you write file name 12 without quotes in the Q object case, it will complain because that's an integer and it was expecting a string. As I mentioned before, there's also a string uh, visitor that takes uh, scalars only. It's used for uh, devices, it's used for uh, uh, outputting uh, 
the QDev tree, the so-called human mode of the string uh, visitor prints things nicely. So if you have a size, it will print 11 gigabytes instead of a huge uh, decimal number. How you use uh, QM? Mm, when you create an object, uh, you set the properties using those wrappers that I mentioned before. And then you add the, 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 the object as a child to something slash somewhere. And then at this point, you can drop the original uh, reference to the object because the object is safe and stays alive thanks to the ch child property. Inside the properties, mm, writing properties is trivial. In this case, you use the bool wrapper, so you just return a bool, uh, accept a bool in uh, RNG set opened. You can have uh, side effects such as this one where if you get a true value, you call uh, an arbitrary method within the object. You have to declare the property within uh, the instance in it uh, callback. And as I mentioned before, this is strictly instance side. Properties cannot be added to the class side. This brings us for good to the two sides of QM. Why does QM have this mixed class-based polymorphism for methods and for interfaces? So you cannot monkey patch a method for a single object, while instead properties are so dynamic and uh, object-based. Actually, most properties are usually handled as if they were static, but there are some uses of dynamic properties, and these are typically related to child properties. What is this di the difference about and how are dynamic properties used? Uh, child properties need to be dynamic because they do not exist until the embedded object is created. The child property defines a canonical path to something and so it cannot be null, for example. While, for example, instead links can be null because they're just something nice that you add on top. Uh, you create an ob uh, a memory region in a device and then only after you have created, you can add it as a child of the parent. Or even more dynamic, the contents of the special path slash objects are completely uh, not in charge as far as uh, uh, QMU, and it's the user that decides to create slash foo by doing minus object id equal foo. And some interesting example of dynamic properties is the so-called array properties. In this case, for example, PCI host slash PCI bus slash child of 12. Uh, this is a, a link, actually, despite the, the name. And it's the 13th object that was added to that particular bus. But these are not really array type properties. It's just that you want to group things together, give them a similar name, because you need to expose it as a child or a link. You can actually have real array properties using a JSON array, a QAPI list equivalently, as the type of the property. <coughs> Dynamic properties are, of course, a pretty bad hurdle towards introspections because property names and types are basically what constitutes the object schema and with dynamic properties, the schema is not something that you know in advance. There is a solution that lets you introspect dynamic objects, which is you instantiate a temporary object, you examine it, and then you just throw it away without adding it as a child or without setting any properties. This is how, for example, minus device Mm, virtuous quasi PCI comma help is implemented. It's not as bad as it sounds because uh, as we will see later, uh, an object that uh, has just been created does nothing interesting and you can throw, throw away that object as you wish. Another big uh, hurdle towards uh, QM schema and the QM schema would actually satisfy that promise of Q 
QRM of providing absolute introspection for everything is that the, we have no QAPI schema introspection in term. Let's say I have a property that is an enumeration value. Without QAPI introspection, I have no idea what values I can assign to that enum, to that property, which makes QM introspection alone fairly useless. There used to be uh, patches for QAPI introspection. Haven't seen them for a few months now, so I guess it's time to actually get them un unstuck. And uh, then once you have done this, the question is uh, whether we should have a QAPI command that lets us expose to management the full QM schema something that replaces the ad hoc solutions we have now, like for listing the properties of a device, uh, like minus device, something comma help, but generalized to all kinds of objects. We may have to decide whether mm, it's time to have real static properties for uh, QM instead of just instance side properties. The predecessor called QDEV of QM used to have static properties, and they actually still are there in the innards of uh, the QM device class, might as well take that, make it more uh, similar to the rest of the QAPI API, and QAM API, sorry, and generalize it. So uh, the second topic and last topic of this talk, you see that it's getting a bit more serious now after the first part, is uh, object lifetime and uh, the composition tree. This is the example I showed before where you have machine, peripheral, and um, devices within. Uh, some devices can be created by the board, for example, the PCI host, uh, the firmware configuration mechanism, while others can be created by the user, either with minus device or, sorry, minus object, of course, we'll put things in slash objects. Now, uh, this is something that could go on, uh, like the QM composition tree could look uh, while the VM is running. But actually, if you look at it, this object, RNG0, doesn't actually have any reference uh, from uh, a virtual RNG device. But still it's alive and it's ready uh, to be connected. So the QM tree actually has a very, very important uh, purpose, something that was at least not advertised by Anthony. Maybe he thought he knew that, but he didn't tell us. That's why we need the exegesis thing. Uh, <laughs> the QM tree is what keeps objects alive. Uh, you want to hot plug a virtual RNG device, you first create the backend, and then you attach the backend to the virtual device itself. In between the two commands, the only reference to the RNG backend comes from the composition tree. You couldn't do any sort of hot plug if it wasn't for this sole reference kept in the composition tree. And this leads us to the next point, which is how do objects uh, die and uh, what's the lifetime of an object like and uh, why this uh, composition tree is so useful for multithreading. A QM object is uh, born in a relatively straightforward way. Uh, you call object new, some instance uh, initialization callback uh, gets invoked. At this time, there is no parent. All properties are initialized to default values. And then you actually prepare that object for uh, doing its work. Uh, you add the object in the QM tree and you set the properties. And then the object is ready to do the, the fun stuff. There's something, some method that gets called uh, in order to <coughs> activate the object. Uh, some, I'm purposely avoiding the word realize because that's currently specific to devices. 
while other objects have this user-creatable interface that they implement, and uh, in that case, the user-creatable complete function is called. It will, for example, allocate memory for uh, RAM or go fetch uh, something from UTLBFS and so on. When you are done with the object, you call object unparent, which eventually will do the opposite of the creation phase. Uh, finalize the object through yet another callback and free the memory. So object and parent is really the mysterious part of the lifetime. Everything else is pretty straightforward. The unparenting function is something that is initiated either by the guest through hot unplug or by management. What it does is basically delete the child property. This has a lot of side effects. When you delete the child property, there is another callback called the parent that is um, invoked automatically by Q QM. And uh, because uh, you delete the child property, the, refer the, the QM tree doesn't refer anymore to the object. There is no canonical path anymore and the a reference to the object is dropped. As we said before, this might as well be the last reference to the object. And when this happens, all properties are deleted. And uh, since some of these properties will be children, you will go recursively into this loop, call the unparent callback, and tear down everything below that object. So, what should the unparent callback do for all these mechanisms to work right? So let's say that it should cause the object to die and disappear. It should hide itself from the guest so that the guest cannot anymore access it. No dangling pointers, we don't want that. And uh, if there are any circular links, that's perfectly fine because as long as the object in the, is in the composition tree, we have an opportunity to drop those circular links. That opportunity is exactly the unparent callbacks. And in fact, we have circular links between the bus and the parent, between uh, uh, the bus and the devices on the bus, but unparent tears down all of that and uh, circular links are fine, are handled just fine. If you don't have circular links, most likely you don't have to do anything, just uh, have any, everything handled by finalization. However, it may still be a good idea to separate the um, hiding of the guest, of the object from the guest from the freeing of memory and leave only the freeing of memory in the instance finalized callback. So there might still be references. These references can come from the guest, from IO initiated by the guest or uh, whatever. Uh, as soon as the guest finishes using the object, the object will be finalized. And this brings us to the next topic again, which is how to handle references from child to parent. Usually the children do, do not care about what their parent is. In many cases, the parent is just a stupid container like slash objects. It's an object that's nothing except providing a namespace. But if you have references from child to parent, you have the problem of avoiding dangling pointers because the parent keeps the children alive through the composition tree, the children keeps the parent alive through reference counting, and if these two get somehow unbalanced, the children risks uh, accessing a parent that's dead. And at the same time, you also have to avoid circular references because those would cause memory leaks solution that we came up with is that references to the parent should be weak and you should only uh, take a reference to the parent while the guest is asking you to do this. Why? Because guest actions cannot happen after unparent returns. Some parent has hidden the, um, the parent. Unparent, sorry, has hidden the, um, the object from the guest and ultimately there is no window for dangling pointers. You get exactly one moment where the object disappears. 
So this is, for example, what we implemented with memory regions, where we have separate reference counting APIs. Uh, one for guest actions that actually touches the reference count of the parent, and one for when you want to do something on the memory region itself without actually looking at the values. It's worth noting that if you add a reference to the parent, the child property will implicitly keep all the children alive, including the memory region itself. Mm, this actually I may come to back to it later for the, if there are questions about it because it's a bit tricky and I don't have much time. So the question in the end is, does it work? I think I showed some examples where we actually introduced uh, interfaces that use all the good things of QAPI, like the object head uh, in QMP interface that's much better than what we had before, like device head or net dev head. And uh, this memory region ref and ref mechanism is actually something that will be very central in order to complete the um, uh, Virtaio SCSI data plane work that Stefan mentioned yesterday. So my answer is that yes, it works, but don't forget it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I guess we're a bit late on time, so yeah. No questions. <laughs>